Desideratum is a Latin word. It means things that are desired as essential. The Desideratum podcast celebrates stories, the art of telling, and the journey of listening. With narrator Teresa Bakken and her author, artist, and wordsmith friends. Episode 28. Yes, mostly um, this was a book that involved a great deal of research, so much research, which yeah. which is fun and interesting, but it's also very easy to just go down that rabbit hole of, of like, oh, I didn't know this and I didn't know that. And oh my God, really, did that happen? And <laughs> This is New York Times bestselling author, Shanna Abe, talking about her new release, The Second Mrs. Astor, a novel of the Titanic. It was interesting because although there is a ton of stuff about Titanic to be found in the in the vast wide world, there was hardly anything to be found about Madeline Force Astor herself. So mm. I had to go and get a subscription to the New York Times, start going through their archived files and just looking up anything I could find about her and basically mm. just tracing the footprints of her life through these mentions of her in the paper. That was kind of fun. It was like discovering who she was by by reading about what she did and where she went and who she talked to. And that's interesting it, to me yeah. because it's funny that you were able to unearth truths about her through the press when the press in her time is a she has a very difficult relationship with she the press. Does. For for Madeline herself, it was just a horrific intrusion into what had been a relatively private life up until that point. Um, and I don't think she was really prepared for how much she was going to be covered in the media. Mm. I don't think anybody could have been prepared because it it just hadn't really happened before, especially, um, you know, considering the technology at the time, news, newspapers were used to just printing sketches of people or events or places, but now there were there were photographs that they could use and they did uh, repeatedly. Wait, did you catch that? Shanna just said this was the moment in history when photography in the press gave us real glimpses of real people. And of course, just like today, there was a real fascination with the rich and famous, their splendor and their scandals in the class structure of the time. But yes, um, I didn't just use newspapers to, to figure out who she was. I used like letters that her sister wrote to other people talking about what happened. And, and other sources, but the newspapers were particularly helpful. And it must have felt a little bit like a treasure hunt when you did find evidence of her yes. places that you could yes. that you could pull together for it. I thought you wrote her, no, I think I wrote down protective, protective of her legacy or protective of her reputation, right? Like I felt like as an author, you, you were presenting her in a light different than maybe what she would have been presented in the press or how she would have been received by this extra uber upper class that she had <laughs> entered into. Yes. Right? Well, I, I think, I think that's actually an excellent way to put it. I, I guess I hadn't thought of it like that before, but yeah, I guess I was protective. It would be easy to see her on the surface as what she was often presented to be, which was this kind of social climber gold digging girl, but she yeah. wasn't, she wasn't because she didn't have to be. Mm -hmm. She had money and she had breeding and she, she had a great life, but she just fell in love with somebody who was from a different atmosphere. She, she fell in love with a Knickerbocker and she wasn't a Knickerbocker. And that was just scandalous all by itself, not yes. to mention the age difference and Jack's divorce and everything. So yeah, she had a lot on her plate. She had a lot to contend with. And, she, you know, you just have to remember, this was a teenage girl handling all of this, just like, you know, Princess Diana was a teenage girl suddenly hugely famous clearly we're in a time period where just holding hands in public like the signaling was was part of the etiquette of the time yeah. so you you felt like there was something very appropriate about their relationship and the way that it progressed yes well that that also would have been the way she was raised i mean she she was from a very good family and she would not have done something like public displays of affections that were not appropriate. You know, that was the time when even just having a dance with the same person two times in a row was just like, oh my God, are you getting married? <laughs> yes. There's talk of marriage after the very first time he interacts with her. Like, yes. oh, 
are you going to marry him? One of the things that I loved about this sort of etiquette of, of interaction that you lay out has to do with flowers. Is that true? And how did that play into the story? The language of flowers is actually just a very clear code of the time. Obviously, red roses means one thing. And Madeline's favorite flowers were these American Beauty red roses. American Beauties were very interesting because they were the status rose of, of the era. It was this mm. big, gorgeous, perfect, deeply scarlet, perfumey rose. And they cost $2 a stem, which is an enormous amount of money in 1910, right? Yeah. So if you got a red, uh, an American Beauty, yes, those were her favorite flowers. He made sure to send them to her. And when they did get married in the ballroom at his his cottage, I'm using finger quotes, you can't see it, but I am cottage <laughs> in Newport, which means mansion. There were American beauties everywhere, everywhere hmm. because he could afford it. So you've written this, this chapters often start with what feels very conversational to her son, to her mm-hmm. child. Yes. And about his father. Right. And the letter that she's writing to Jakey. Yes. Yes. And then we sort of, we jump back in time and we get a, it goes back into sort of a third person account. What point in your writing did you decide to lay the story out that way and why? I open with the ending, which is, which is her, you know, surviving the shipwreck or the sinking rather, and, and having given birth to their son. So none of that can be a surprise to the reader. So I I just thought that's a good way to just introduce everything to to make it less linear, I guess, and then keep everybody involved to say, oh, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? Because you already know the ending. So I wanted, I wanted A, to have her, her voice coming straight at the reader. And then I wanted her to, I wanted the, the third person thing to take a step back to, to make it, to put a little bit of distance and to feel the time period a little bit better, I guess. Yeah. For me, that's a good device is just to, um, you have, you have, you're in her head in a kind of a more immediate way in, in the letters. And then you take a step back and you're like with her instead of being yes. in her head for yes. the main part of the story. It added a dimension to it. That's why I wanted to do it. That's an excellent explanation. There's also a gentleness of knowing that she does survive and the child survives. Yes. You know, it yes. puts you a little bit at ease as a reader. Right. Because you can wrap your brain around the tragedy that's coming, but you're at least at ease knowing that the child, she's had right. the child and the child is okay. Um, And her wanting to explain this very brief, it's two years of her life. You know, it's just this, it's this tiny window of, of love. And um, one of the things that she writes to him about that I remember that I made a note about was this, the way that she associates the smell of flowers or something about lilies at his funeral and the sort of sweetness of the the smell of it um, washing over her. And so you're very sensory in that way, the way you've incorporated the flowers? I, you know, I, I guess I am. I, you're reading words on a page and it's engaged in your mind. But if I can make you smell the flowers, if I can make you feel the salty wind through your hair the way she did, then, then I'm succeeding at something. So yeah, I try to incorporate scents and flavors as well as just visual ideas yes. so that the story feels more complete. I hope <laughs> that's the goal. Yeah. It feels more complete to the reader. So how did you as a writer, get yourself in the mood for that? How were you able to do that? Again, it was a lot of research and I I would keep like pictures of Madeline and Jack and Kitty the dog and anything I could find of them and of Titanic on my desktop, on my, my computer desktop. So I could just look at them and think about who they were and how they were and where they were. And, um, I'm a visual person myself. So the pictures really helped me. And then I have an idea of, of like, what must it have what must it have been like to have been them, to live like that? Yes. And the flowers, it's interesting you mentioned that because the flowers are, it's kind of a, a mark of the, of the wealthy, especially then. I mean, freshly cut flowers, even in winter, they were pricey, right? And so you would go to these Newport mansions or the, you know, the Chateau on Fifth Avenue, and there really would be like fresh flowers everywhere. And on Titanic also. They had all those freshly cut flowers to say, yes, you are on the best ship. This is the most luxurious ship. Look, we're giving you fresh flowers and it's April. And where did we get them? Oh, hot houses in France, you know, kind of thing. So, okay. So did she really know Margaret Brown? 
Yes, all of that is true. Margaret Brown, and we call her the unsinkable Molly Brown, but that's not accurate. You're, you're a Colorado girl, you know that. Know that's not accurate. So um, <laughs> yes, Margaret Brown, um, she was their friend. She was one of the, I don't know to say few, but one of these special people who did not shun Jack Astor after his divorce from his first wife and was happy to welcome Madeline into her world because mm -hmm. you know she had come from this kind of rough and tumble background herself and she knew what it was like have people just shun you because you weren't of their group. So yes, and they, she really, Margaret Brown and her daughter Helen really did go with the Astors to Egypt on this wow. extended tour up and down the Nile. And they were all friends. And, um, and Kitty, by the way, really did get lost in Egypt. That, that whole part of the story was true as well. Kitty the dog. And she really did get lost in Egypt and, and they were pretty distraught about it. And then they found her again and they were happy. But um, Okay, so how did you piece that together? Where did that? Oh my God! <laughs> where did that info come from? It's not that like you could call from... somebody up and say, "Did they? Did they have a dog?" <laughs> from a, a book I read called "Gilded Lives: Fatal Voyage" by Hugh Hugh Brewster. He did a fantastic researching job, and the most interesting part of that book, because obviously it was about all the first class passengers, it was you would comb through his his footnotes and his indexes and his sources, and he had a letter from from Catherine detailing how Kitty got lost and how how upset Madeline and Jack were about it and how happy they were when they found Kitty sailing up river on this other boat to go in the opposite direction <laughs> and they got reunited yeah that and I'm just like well that's definitely going in the story I love Kitty <laughs> Kitty's one of my favorite characters in this book yes and we should say again Kitty is a dog Kitty is their dog their, their, their dog, dog. Yes. and their dog um it's, it was one of the things I loved in the story. Her sister says something when they first are meeting Jack about how you can judge a man by how he treats his pets, his dog, yes. his animals, how, he, how he, someone treats animals. And right. so it's one of the ways we come to, to care about Jack or know yeah. that he's a good guy is in that, in that scene where you show him being loving with his pet, being, being yes. um, kind to his dog. Yes. And in so many of the pictures I found of Jack and Madeline together online outside, Kitty was almost always with them. And sometimes it's hard to see, like she's walking a little bit behind them. I'm like, oh, that's her tail. Or there she is sitting in the shade of the tree while they're talking. And she was just always with them. They love that dog. They loved her. So I had to love Jack more because I'm an animal person myself. <laughs> Let's pause there in our conversation with Shanna to hear a scene. This is in chapter one, near the beginning of the book. Madeline is on stage, and Jack Astor is in the audience. It's their first official meeting. This is from The Second Mrs. Astor, written by Shanna Abe, narrated by Lauren Ezzo. The previous night's opening had left Madeline shaking with nerves, but tonight she felt better. She was a creature composed of flaming hot candle lanterns and greasy face paint and flowers, saturated in poetry and song. The heels of her boots struck the stage so lightly, she felt at times she might actually be floating. Beyond the lights lining the edge of the proscenium, beneath the darkened stained glass chandeliers, sat the hushed, breathing beast that was the audience. Except for the occasional muffled cough, the subtle twinkle of diamonds and earrings and collars, the beast was unseen, unheard. It was there and not there, anonymous, at least until it roused itself into applause. But, on her third twirl, you promised me to wed, so would I had done by yonder sun? She saw him. She had no idea how she'd missed him before. He was in the front of the house very nearly sent her. A demon or a ghost could not have materialized more suddenly out of the shadows. Colonel Astor kept his focus fixed exactly on her, his hands folded in his lap. In the half-light cast from the stage, the planes of his face gleamed dim and harsh. The toe of one boot scraped the stage. Madeline stumbled. She stopped and turned in the abrupt silence then looked upstage and realized the other members of the cast were all staring expectantly at her. It must be her line. Her mind was a fizzy blank. She stared back at them helplessly, the roar of her blood louder and louder in her ears. In the back of the house, 
someone sneezed. Once, twice. Dorothy Cramp, who had been so bitter with envy that Madeline had won the part of Ophelia that she'd threatened to renounce the League, glared at Madeline from beneath the tin of King Claudius's crown. How long has she been thus? Dorothy said again, biting off every word. The fizziness in Madeline's brain cleared. She remembered her song, her wild dance, what to do. She got through her next lines and then swept off the stage in a storm of petals and leaves and spent the rest of the show watching him from behind a slit in the stage right curtain. After the curtain call, which included a pelting of bouquets, backstage was a jumble of cast and crew, everyone talking and laughing. Props teetered in precarious piles. Willowy young women in wigs and trousers jostled back and forth, abandoning their wooden swords and bulky vests, hugging and kissing and telling each other how perfect it all was, how spectacular, and how next year they would tackle Moliere or Marlowe and all the world would bow at their feet. Madeline accidentally bumped shoulders with Dorothy and smiled. Part apology, part dare. But Dorothy ignored her and walked away. By the velvet-swathed entrance to the house stood Mrs. Ogden Mills, a matron so prominent and formidable that Madeline could not recall seeing her even once without at least four strands of pearls around her neck, no matter the time of day. Amid all the bustle and mayhem of the play's aftermath, she remained as motionless as a graveyard statue. Even caught up in the giddy, we-did-it silliness bubbling around them, none of the Junior League debutantes dared to venture too close. Miss Force, Mrs. Mills said, lifting her brows and tilting her head toward the man standing, also unmoving, slightly behind her. Have you met the colonel? Of course Madeline hadn't. She wasn't even officially out yet. There was no reason at all for someone like John Jacob Astor IV to have taken notice of her. She was still in her mad weeds. She dripped with wilted petals and curling leaves. Her hair was fraying from its braids. Candy tuft dribbled down her shoulders, teeny white starbursts at a time. A stolen glance in a small rectangle of a mirror tacked to a flat revealed her eyes, pale blue smudged with coal, her skin plastered white, cheeks and lips still painted red as blood. The colonel glanced where she did, noticed the mirror. The skin along her cheekbones began to prickle with heat. Jack, continued Mrs. Mills, oblivious, serene. I would like to introduce you to Miss Madeline Force, daughter of William and Catherine Force of Brooklyn and of late Manhattan. You saw her as our Ophelia tonight. Madeline, Colonel John Jacob Astor. There was no choice but to extend her hand. He accepted it, his fingers folding firm and warm over hers. How do you do? she asked faintly. How do you do? he echoed, soft. It was as though her vision failed and she could not see him, in spite of the fact that he was right there in front of her. She didn't see him so much as feel his presence. The warm, tanned glow of his skin, the knowing curve of his mouth, the air of a man who knew what he wanted and was not bothered by the wanting because everything he touched was already his. Madeline felt thirteen again, back on that rock-scrubbed beach, that moment when their eyes had met, and his smile seemed just for her. From somewhere near her left shoulder, a pop of light flared, died, but she didn't turn her head to see what it was. You were excellent tonight, the colonel said, letting go of her hand. She stopped herself from wiping her tingling palm down her dress. I could have been better, I'm afraid. I don't see how, he said, and with a nod to Mrs. Mills, angled away. A moment later he was gone, devoured by the crush. Mrs. Ogden Mills sent Madeline a pointed look. Madeline smiled tightly, murmured her thanks, and retreated slowly, gratefully, 
back into the Junior League crowd. It was only much later, hours later, as she lay sleepless in her bed and stared out her window at the cascading, moon-silvered clouds, that Madeline realized the pop of light backstage must have been a magnesium flash from a photographer, stealing for himself that moment when Colonel Astor had first taken her hand. As we jump back into our conversation with Shanna, you should know I've just asked her about a passage much later in the book, after the Titanic sinks, and she immediately finds it and reads a few lines for us. Yeah, this is part of her letter to her son, Jakey, and uh, she's talking about how the press is asking her, well, what was the best part about Titanic? And she's saying, is that supposed to negate everything that happened? I'm not gonna to talk to you. She's, at this point, she's done with giving interviews with the press. She's done with being hounded and she's, mm -hmm. she's coming into her own. But she says, I'll answer that question for you, my son, because you were there and your father was there and so was I, all three of us together, locked in love for that blink of a moment in time. The best memory I have about Titanic was that she was so large, so epic, I never felt any swaying or bobbing or turbulence to interfere with my meals, my sensitive appetite, or my slumber. I never felt any sort of vulnerability aboard that ocean liner right up until the very end. I imagine that's a blessing, don't you? Whoever wants to know how it's going to end before it actually does. Only poets and madmen, I would think. All along, she has a strength to her. She talks about not wanting to sit still and be unnoticed and quiet, and she, has, she wants to live. Right. And that sense of her carries through into this part of the story that you just read. She just has a, a will and a positiveness about her, like even given that tragedy, right? Yes. Yes. It's what she focuses on is that when she was there, she felt stable and she was there with yes. his father. She was there in love. Yes. You almost oh. get the sense like she wouldn't change it. You know what I mean? Like she has yes. a positive sense of moving forward. I thought it was oh. a great way to write her. It had to do with her growth, but also her, her strength through the whole thing. Right. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm so glad that that came, that, that came across. <laughs> what I was trying to impart is that even though she is young, even though she is a female in this time where females are supposed to be delicate little flowers, she had to not be a delicate flower. She had to be her true self to get through this ordeal for the sake of herself and her son. So yes, uh, yes she was, I think she surprised herself with her own strength. That's yes. my impression about her. Yes. This was a real it, woman who lived in a time period who's there's evidence of her and her decisions in her life. And was that harder as an author? Yes. <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah. It was a lot harder because I really wanted to be true to who she really was as a human being. And that meant I had to find out who she was as a human being and try to portray that as accurately as I could within this within this story that's meant to entertain you ultimately, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm both happy and sad, bittersweet, but still it is fiction. And it's not like when I would write about dragons. <laughs> I loved writing about dragons because nobody could contact me and say, hey, dragons aren't like that. You can't say that. I'm going to be like, yes, they are. I just made them up and it's my world and it's my rules. So there, <laughs> but no, for this, yes, I wanted to, I mean, obviously you have to get all the Titanic stuff exactly right because there's so many people out there who are just just extreme Titanic fans. And I get yeah. it, Titanic is really a fascinating subject. So, and so the Titanic stuff is all just extremely true to the way it was. Everything mm -hmm. I described was what was there. And the people there were, I think I've just got one made up person in the whole story. I had Madeline's junior league friends names and physical appearance mapped out and everything. And my, my editor is like, you know, here's another Margaret because everybody's names are like Margaret or Catherine or Alice. <laughs> <laughs> everybody had the same names. And she's like, can we make something up? And I'm like, let's call her Stella after my dog. So that was, that was the only made up person. Everybody else is, is pretty much factual. Wow. The family, um, Charlotte Cardeza, the, the socialite and the bully, they were there. Margaret Brown, obviously real, her daughter, Helen real. And the fact that Thanks. Margaret was not supposed to actually be on Titanic, it was a last minute decision that she made. Her grandson in Denver was, was ill and she was rushing to get home to him. I'm so glad that that part of it was true and that she really is intertwined in the story because yes. 
I just, yeah, she's also just a great person of history, a great, yes. her- a great heroine of history. So it's nice that she has a place in your book as well. I was also really glad to discover that, it, that she went with them to Egypt. I'm like, oh, I get to write about Margaret Brown. <laughs> All right. I've been to the Molly Brown house since I was a child. <laughs> Extremely <laughs> famous for the Denver area, but yeah, yes. really cool that, that, that their paths crossed um, in authenticity and that you yes. could write about her was really, because she plays she plays a version of herself from what I know of her yeah, as someone yeah. of, as someone of ethic of someone who would be kind. So I always like to ask the authors that, <laughs> um, that come on for you, what are, like, if you had to, you had to tell somebody this, this is an essential thing to me. This is what I think of as essential for you. What do you think you would tell them? Oh, be kind to yourself and be kind to others. Have a kind heart. Um, and that way, you know, you don't have to worry about being bitter. You don't have to worry about being jealous. And uh, if you forgive yourself your mistakes by being kind to yourself, you will lead a more peaceful and pleasant life. The kinder heart is the stronger heart. But the kind heart is the stronger heart. Yes. It's something that Madeline's mom tells her. Yes. I love that you mentioned that. That's perfect. Oh, good. <laughs> That's, That's what perfect. came to mind. <laughs> yeah. It's clearly part of who you are. That's I, great. I try. <laughs> you have to keep, you have to be mindful about it, right? You, because it can be a struggle. You have to be mindful and be present and, yes. and try to have an optimistic outlook and just forgive people and forgive yourself. And I think it makes you a happier person overall. You can find a link to Shanna Abe's website and a link to purchase her book and audiobook in the show notes. Thanks to Vida at Kensington Press for connecting me to Shanna. And thanks to Tantor Audio for the excerpt of Lauren Ezzo's brilliant work. And as always, thank you for listening.